Now, what I wanted to do, uh, and this is only going to take about uh, uh, 15 minutes or so, I wanted to kind of give you an introduction today so that you won't walk into the labs this week completely unaware of what we're trying to do. And, and basically in, in this, uh, this laboratory, we're going to talk about the primary tool that most entomologists use, and, and that's pesticides. Uh, pesticides are poisons. Uh, they're, they're chemicals that are intended to kill a target organism. But just like we were talking about, even though we might be using something like an insect growth regulator, that insect growth regulator may have an adverse effect on other arthropods, what we would call non-target organisms. So we have to be aware of that. Uh, and what I've been, uh, titled this one is, is uh, our uh, initial discussion of what we call integrated pest management. Now, how did we get to this integrated pest management? Well, we have to go back quite a ways and, and see the evolution of what I call pest management. And here are some of the terminology that, that is often used. Uh, now, even to this day, if you have a really bad bug problem, let's say it's bed bugs that, that, that might be in your apartment or house, who you going to call? You know, everybody says, well, I, I'm going to call the exterminator. Uh, and, and what does that, that imply to you? What's an exterminator going to do? Theoretically, they're going to come and kill them all off. And, and, and that, boy, that, that sounds great and wonderful. In the case of bed bugs, yeah, that, that would be the goal. You really want to exterminate the bed bugs that are in your house. But on the other hand, did you really exterminate all the bed bugs? No, there's still bed bugs other places the, the, that could come in there. And, and so it's kind of interesting. Uh, one of the terms that, that's often used is eradication. And I'm here to tell you that in Southern California, they have eradicated the medfly five times. What's the problem with that thinking? Well, the, the, the thinking is, is that you really can't eradicate any pests. That means completely get rid of it for everywhere. Now, in the case of that medfly, yes, they eradicated it from California, but through international commerce or bringing new fruits and vegetables uh, in here that probably weren't inspected correctly, the medfly was reintroduced uh, in, in those areas. And, and so we still use the term eradication. Now, I don't use eradication for everyday insect problems or for our fruit and vegetable and field crop uh, pests, but I use the term eradication for foreign invading pests. Uh, and to give you an example on, on that, uh, we thought that we could eradicate the emerald ash borer, but we found out because of the nature and the biology of that beast, no, not possible. On the other hand, uh, I just uh, got a notice about a week and a half ago that the state is about ready to declare that they have eradicated the Asian longhorn beetle down from the southern part of the state, uh, at least out of two counties where they had originally found. So they're, they're whittling that population down. And the reason why they can do that is that it's a very slow to spread insect. It's very easy to detect uh, and eliminate once you detect it. And, and so because of the nature of that beast, we've been able to eradicate it. Uh, I'm a little bit worried right now. We've got the, this uh, 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 little uh, plant hopper that, that's over in Pennsylvania, and, and that one seems to uh, uh, have also escape. So, but we still like the term, uh, still use the term eradication. Now, extermination is, is the one that most entomologists will definitely avoid uh, because to the average person, it, the extermination is pretty equivalent to them of eradication. Uh, that you're going to completely get rid of them. And, and again, you could probably, in, a, in the case of bed bugs, you can completely get rid of bed bugs out of your apartment or your house. And as long as you don't reintroduce them, yeah, they'll stay gone. But I'm here to tell you, you're almost never going to be able to exterminate termites. Uh, even though you called an exterminator to come in and treat your house for termites. Uh, and the reason for that is that we now know, you'll, we'll learn uh, here in a couple of weeks, that the average subterranean termite colony here in Ohio occupies a three to five city block area. 
And so you may have killed them off around your house, but you certainly didn't get rid of the colony uh, because it, it's very difficult to do. Yes? So what is the difference between eradication and extermination? Uh, extermination just means to kill them all. Eradication means to eliminate them in a defined area, to completely get rid of them in a defined area. So as you can see, they, they, they kind of overlap in, in some of that. Uh, now, uh, when we came out of the Second World War, uh, we had discovered some new chemistry, some new insecticides that were pretty miraculous. Uh, uh, just grams of this material was killing all the insects that, that were subjected to it. That was the day of DDT and, and some of those types of, of uh, chemistry. Uh, and since uh, we had come back from the war and we had beat the, the, the uh, uh, Germans and the Japanese and, and uh, uh, control them, uh, we sort of used that term, that, that we had control over the insects. Uh, and it wasn't until a little bit later that we found out that we didn't really have control of the insects. Guess what a lot of the insects did when we subjected them those, to those chemicals? They became resistant to those chemicals and came back with a vengeance. And actually that's kind of what's going on right now with the chinch bu or the, the bed bugs. Uh, the bed bug populations are highly resistant to many of the insecticide categories that we have traditionally used. And, and so we've had to figure out other ways to, to manage them. Most entomologists now will, will talk about pest management. And the reason why we use the term management is to acknowledge that all we can do with most pests is try to keep their populations down below a level that doesn't cause us any real problems. And, and so pest management is, is the term that, that is preferred here because it does acknowledge that uh, we don't have complete control over these pests, uh, but we can usually do different kinds of techniques to keep them suppressed and, and not causing any uh, problems. Now, the, the latest term on the block, uh, everybody's talking about sustainability. Environmental sustainability, green sustainability, and, and so forth, and it means so many different things to many, uh, so many different people. Uh, frankly, I don't use the term sustainability uh, because it, it, to me it comes with way too much baggage uh, right now and, and misidentifications and, and misunderstandings. But I think it's a useful tool. Uh, it's, it's a useful term to think about uh, when I'm trying to manage insects. Can I figure out a system, an ecosystem approach that this whole system would keep pests, manage them down to levels that they rarely or almost never cause problems, uh, and, uh, yet I need few inputs? That, that go into the, the system. And that's what sustainability really means is it's a system that basically needs few or no inputs to keep going. And, and so everybody's talking about organic farming and organic gardening and all the rest of that. But the reality is, is there's still inputs and there are outputs to that. And, and so, but uh, I like the term, it, it gives me as a scientist, things that I can hypothesize about and do some testing to see if they work or don't work in this system. Now there's a whole bunch of terminology related to the pests themselves and, and hopefully a lot of these terms should be pretty self-evident. Uh, what do you think a chronic pest would be? Have you ever had a summer without mosquitoes? <laughs> I don't think so. Now, you've had years where mosquitoes were really bad and years where they weren't very bad, but they've always been here. They, they're, they're chronic. They're always with us. And, and so we always find that there are certain pests that are always with us. And, and uh, what a key pest often is is one that causes uh, significant damage on a regular basis or, or can flat out kill my crops or cause problems that way. Obviously, an occasional pest is one that we rarely see it, but every once in a while it shows up uh, as, as a pest. And, and uh, uh, then we have to, to uh, uh, be uh, uh, 
uh, cognizant of it and, and figure out do we need to do something about it or uh, will it just naturally go away on its own? Don't worry about it. <clears throat> we have uh, things like uh, a rare pest, and, and uh, again, there are very few of those, but it's kind of interesting to me that rare pest is changing. It used to be that here in Ohio, we had a couple of insects that attacked our vegetable crops that you almost never saw. But now they're occurring almost every year. What the heck's going on? Our climate is changing. Uh, we're, we're finding pests that didn't used to occur here in Ohio. They were much more common down in, in Kentucky and Tennessee, but now they're occurring on a fairly regular basis up here. And, and so uh, sometimes a, a rare pest is just something that didn't occur here, but now uh, it, it is occurring. A potential pest, just like the name says, is, is that uh, it may be an insect that normally doesn't cause any problems, but every once in a while it builds up populations and does cause problems, and, and so it potentially can be a pest. Now, secondary pests is, is a little bit dif more difficult to describe. Now, in this particular case, I'm going to use the coddling moth. Uh, the coddling moth is the apple worm. That, that's the traditional little caterpillar that will sometimes get into an apple. Uh, there's nothing worse, the, the old joke is, there's nothing worse than biting into the apple and seeing the other half of the apple worm, uh, because that means you've got half of it in your mouth and, and probably chewing up. Now, as an entomologist, to me, that's no problem. You're probably getting better, higher quality carbohydrate and, and protein uh, from that uh, coddling moth larva, but it's uh, also, uh, for most people, kind of on the yucky side. Now, after the Second World War, we figured out that by using certain insecticides, we could really control the coddling moth. But when we used these sprays to control the coddling moth, all of a sudden, we were getting spider mites on our apple trees. What happened? Well, spider mites were always there, but they had their natural biological controls that were keeping them in control. So when we sprayed the insecticides that controlled the coddling moth, that accidentally killed the predators for the spider mites, and the spider mites became now a secondary or induced pest. So you get get what I'm talking about there is that an induced pest is something that we've actually gone in and, and we've tried to manage some other pest and we often do a good job but then something that wasn't a pest but it was in the system and there becomes a pest. I think in this day and age we're all familiar with exotic pests. I mean all you have to do Gypsy moth, Japanese beetle, emerald ash borer, Asian longhorn beetle. You can just go down and down and down the list. Uh, frankly, uh, I'm beginning to see we now have two earthworms that are pests. Uh, we, we've got what is called the green stink worm and the red wiggler, which were brought in by fisher people uh, primarily because they stayed alive on the hook a lot longer than the, the lumbricus terrestricus, which is actually also not a native insect. Uh, to North America, uh, and, and so these things are coming in, and, and once they're free of their natural control agents in a new land, uh, they, they can reproduce at, at will and, and often do so. <clears throat> An indigenous pest is something that's been here all along. Coddling moth is a native to North America. Uh, and, and actually, coddling moth was not a pest in Europe, but when the Europeans brought their apples over here into North America, they found the coddling moth. So that, that was an indigenous pest. Some of the other terms here, a target pest is that when I'm applying a control material, I have a target. I've, I've got a pest that I really want to try to manage and bring it down to a level that it's not causing any problems. A non-target, now, this is, I, I don't like this term, we often call it a non-target pest. The better term here would be a non-target organism. And what I'm talking about here is I go back to that coddling moth. When I sprayed the insecticide to control the coddling moth, I accidentally killed off the predators for the spider mites and the spider mites had an outbreak. So that would be a non-target organism that was affected by my control efforts. I'm sorry? Uh, 
Now, you're, what you're calling a locust is what I call a cicada? <laughs> oh, the true locusts are grasshoppers. Okay, so the, the, the true grasshoppers are plant feeders. Uh, and what usually kicks off the, the migratory locust populations is rainfall events because the grasshoppers are primarily controlled by the soil moisture in the soil. When the, the female shoves her ovipositor down in the soil and lays an egg mass, if that soil is moist, virtually all those eggs will hatch. But if the soil is dry, very few of those eggs will hatch out. And so typically we find the locust swarms having an outbreak after we've had a series of rainfall events that have kept the soil moist for about a month and a half to two months, which is enough for the grasshoppers to lay those eggs and build up big populations. And, and so in, in that particular case, that would be what I would call a sporadic pest. Uh, and, and it's a sporadic pest that falls higher than normal rainfall events. Okay? That's how I'd use those terms. Now, uh, some other things when it comes to pest management is, is the types of damage that, that they cause. Direct damage would be like the coddling moth. That coddling moth gets into the apple. The apple is what I want to harvest, and it will destroy the apple. On the other hand, the spider mites that were feeding on the apple tree damage the leaves of the apple tree. So the apples that are produced are usually smaller than they should be. That would be an indirect effect. So do you see the, the difference between direct and indirect in there? Aesthetic damage, all you got to do is go stand over at, at Kroger, Kroger or Giant Eagle in the produce aisle. And, it, and it's, it's amazing. We, we've got a, a bunch of ladies in my neighborhood that whenever the green beans go on sale, they literally go out and pull each individual green bean and inspect it. And if it's got any little... Uh, problem with it and, and you know they're always standing around there the green beans are at 99 cents a, a pound and I just reach in with my big hairy arm and I just grab a bunch of them throw them in the bag and go off and and of course my wife harps at me she says you brought a couple of these home just throw them away at 99 cents who cares uh, but aesthetic damage is very important ideal in an area in turf and ornamentals where everything is aesthetics People want their lawn to be a nice green, even color with no weeds in it. They want all their trees and shrubs to be a perfect shape and form and color and, and so forth. And when there's an insect or a mite or a pest that comes in and, and sort of removes that from their, their vision, they want something to be done about it. But in reality, most of that damage that's done to the tree, shrub, and turf is, again, just the aesthetic. It's not really damaging the plant in the long run of its health. <clears throat> Vectors of disease are extremely important to us because if mosquitoes didn't vector diseases, they would just be a nuisance to us. But since they transmit diseases, we have to watch them very carefully. We have to watch which species is, is uh, flying around and is it carrying the disease or not. And when that does, we pull the trigger uh, to, to manage them. Same thing goes in, in plants. There are insects that vector diseases of plants. And so we have a, what we call a very th low threshold uh, for those populations because of that. We'll also, uh, I, I hope to get to this, uh, as I said, we're going to change this lab. I'm going to bring in some food products for you to eat. And then I'm going to tell you the amount of insects that was likely in that food product. <laughs>